thanks everybody for coming to our talk. Uh, the talk is titled Tech When the Sky is Falling, Tools for Crisis Response. A little bit about us. My name is Colin Schimmelfing. I am currently doing a master's of environmental science and management at UC Santa Barbara's Bren School for the Environment, or as I like to call it, an MBA for hippies. I also spent before this 10 years as a software engineer and engineering manager. And I'm Emma Ferguson. Uh, I'm currently a full stack and infrastructure engineer at Samsara, which is an IoT operations company. Uh, I make technology for trucks. And I've been a software engineer for about five years. Before that, I was a data analyst for some years. Cool. cool. And we actually, we know each other from college, so we've known each other for over a decade. And this is the first time that we've actually worked together on the same project. So let's introduce uh, the most important character in this talk, uh, Mask Match. Mask Match is a peer-to-peer -peer mask donation website that we ran from March to July of 2020. Uh, it enabled donations of masks from individuals directly to healthcare providers and workers uh, in order to ease the personal protective equipment shortage that was like so rampant around the world in early 2020. Uh, and we delivered almost a million masks. So this talk is gonna be about how we got there and what you can learn from our terrible mistakes. So we're trying to give you, in this talk, a framework for tech-enabled crisis response. That sounds like a lot of words, we'll break it down. Um, but basically, we don't think that COVID is the last global crisis that we will experience in our lifetime and, and your lifetimes. And given that you are sitting in this room, you will probably want to help and you probably have the tech skills that you might want to use to try and help. So we would love to give you a little bit of an idea of what you might expect so that you can hit the ground running and help the most effective way possible. Here's our framework that we kind of came up with, thinking about the different phases of what one of these tech-enabled crisis responses, what they look like. So five different phases, we'll break down each one, but phase one, validate your idea, make it repeatable, scale vertically, stabilize, and then adapt or shut down. Before we jump into Mask Match, um, we want to say a little bit about what we're not going to talk about in this talk. Um, Mask Match was not a long-term nonprofit that we built to like, continue on into the future past us. It was crisis response. What that means is um, it was not a sustainable effort. Crises are short-term. Um, a crisis is going to require immediate intervention, and so when you are working on crisis response, your measures will be stopgap. A crisis is very specific, and your crisis response is not going to change an entire system. And finally, a crisis does not occur in a vacuum. And so crisis response should be as equitable as possible within the time constraints that you're working within. OK, so let's get into this. Remember back in March 2020, where were you? Just think about that. And think about how you felt at the time. At the time, COVID had gone from something that was really scary happening in China and Italy to now something that was here in the United States. Cases were exploding. Everybody was trying to figure out, well, how does it spread? What do we do? Nobody had any idea. Uh, everybody was trying to lock down, bend the curve. It was all scary. And there was one sort of sub-crisis that was coming to really dominate the news, which was the personal protective equipment shortage for healthcare workers. Um, the situation we were in was we are facing a like, national and indeed global healthcare crisis, and we have no way to protect the healthcare workers who could be keeping the rest of us safe. Um, the World Health Organizi Organization is like putting out these bulletins that are like so apocalyptic, um, and it was like everywhere. Um, for those of us sitting at home and just like refreshing our news apps, it was like felt like this was the only thing there. And it also felt like we couldn't do anything about it. All we could do is just sit there. The best thing we could do is stay home, and that felt powerless. So when this email ended up in my inbox, I was intrigued. Emma, could you actually fill me in? Uh, I knew almost nothing. <laughs> um, Elena is a mutual friend of ours who we also went to college with. Uh, and she had sent Colin this email um, to try to hook him up with me. Previously, she had sent me a mystery Zoom link to talk to these two women about something. Um, so about 30 minutes after Colin got this email, we got onto a Zoom call with these two women. Um, Liz Klinger and Chloe Alpert are both co-founders and CEOs of startups in the healthcare space. Additionally, uh, Liz's mom was a nurse, so she was getting this very up-close and personal view of the PPE shortage. Um, so we got on this Zoom call with them to talk about some kind of COVID response project. Um, they had this very elegant idea. So 
the idea was healthcare workers need masks, and lots of people have masks at home, whether that's in California because of wildfires or just under their workbench for when they're sanding or painting something. However, if those people tried to donate those masks to healthcare workers, especially at hospitals, the hospital administrators would just throw away those masks, which was a complete tragedy. Uh, they wouldn't accept it for liability reasons. However, if you were a nurse or a doctor or a healthcare worker, you could bring your own PPE in and share it with your colleagues. So that leads to the following idea. Let's skip the hospitals and mail masks from people who have them directly to healthcare workers. That was their idea. And they had set up a very simple website about 24 hours prior, uh, just started recording a bunch of stuff in Google Sheets, um, and they had, within 24 hours, 300 requests for masks from healthcare workers, and a few donations, mostly from their friends. So we're gonna show you, while, while they were telling, telling us this, and we were thinking about, well, should we do it or not, uh, we were texting each other back and forth, and we'll, we'll show you a little bit behind the scenes what, what we were doing. So classic software engineers. <laughs> so that's my cool project, right? <laughs> we were like, this will probably take like a weekend, right? <laughs> classic time estimation. Yeah, that's not our strong suit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it turned out it was a little more complicated than that. But we got on the Zoom call. We said, yes, sounds great. And that dropped us into phase one. Um, phase one is validate your solution. You see a problem, you have an idea, figure out if it actually helps. This took for mask match about 36 hours. So. The problem statement for your phase one is going to be, does your plan solution solve the problem you've identified? Your planning horizon is right now. Um, you are not doing any future planning. It is only about what is breaking in this moment, and your technical priorities are create some kind of process, reduce errors with that process, and then track your successes so you can tell if it's working. So here is the process that we came up with. One, validation. We wanted to make sure that the people sending us requests for masks were actually frontline healthcare workers. So we did some lightweight validation, mostly using LinkedIn. Two, make matches. So you have people saying, I have masks. You have people saying, I need masks. You match them up. Um, you ask the donors to send, uh, you send the donor the recipient's uh, home address, and then you ask the donor to send you back a tracking number. And then there are follow-up communications. Once you get that tracking number back, you email it to the person who's going to be getting the masks so they know when the package is gonna arrive. Uh, there's also um, some like bookkeeping, so you mark that match as complete, so you're not trying to like send the same person to the sa same two people the same masks. And then there's a lot of tracking down donations. <laughs> so you email your donors these recipient addresses, you never get tracking numbers, and you spend a lot of time going like, hey, friend, did you put those masks in the mail? Uh, and this is all happening in this system. So. We have a website, really simple, Squarespace, type form forms that flow into Google Sheets, and then all the volunteer jobs I just outlined are basically in uh, Gmail inboxes and then going back and forth with those Google Sheets. And if you ever built a little web app, um, you're gonna notice that our data flow is a little messy, and a lot of the problems are gonna occur pretty much right about here. So in these first 36 hours, um, all we were trying to do is like take a total disaster Google Sheets and turn them into human readable Google Sheets. Uh, things like instead of five or six colors of green highlighting, maybe use different colors so you can tell what the colors mean when you look at the sheet. Um, maybe like try to get the type form form such that the address data is always coming in in the same format. Really, really basic. Um, this is incredibly tech light. And this is not actually software engineering, you might notice. <laughs> All you're trying to do in this phase is figure out does it work, and then set your operations up so that you're enabling tech in your next phases. So at the end of this phase, all we had learned was, OK, this totally works. In the first 36 hours, we shipped about 300 masks to healthcare workers. Um, not, a not, not a lot, but enough to tell us that this can, this can work. So phase two is now make it repeatable. You know that you can do the operation of getting masks from people who have them to healthcare workers. Um, let's actually start to use software to really make this, this happen. For us, this took two days. Probably this will take longer. Um, that was a very short two days. Um, so it's working, great. Uh, we're getting mass to healthcare workers, we're getting press, we're getting donations. Uh, we go from four volunteers to 39 volunteers to 73 volunteers one day later, which is awesome, but then chaos. So now we have 73 volunteers, and they are working out of two tabs of a giant Google Sheet. Guess how many concurrent edits you can have on a Google Sheet? Yes, that's. 50, which is less than 73, you're all good at math. That was chaos. 
Then working out of three Gmail inboxes, guess how many emails you can send from one Gmail inbox every day? That's 500 emails per day, but we're sending three per donation. And so our volunteers are literally having to choose between waiting until the next day to email somebody or emailing somebody from a different email address than they've already been communicating with because that email address is out of emails for that day. So it was chaos, it was stressful, it was not great. And we were having some data integrity issues as well where maybe somebody has double allocated a donation. Somebody's promised 10 masks and then somebody else has promised the same 10 masks and now you have to go and really hustle to try and find those other 10 masks um, or just unclear statuses and comments. So when you're trying to deal with these issues, how do you do that? That's right, more email, which just goes right back to the first problem and sets you right back into email hell again. So the problem here is how do you use technology to repeatedly successfully apply your solution? And the planning horizon is right now, you are just getting slammed with issues left and right, everything's on fire, your technical priorities are trying to lock down that data, data integrity, enable volunteer workflows to actually work, and then measure your impact. For data integrity, Google Sheets is probably still the right tool at this point, uh, but let's just lock it down a little bit log edits to certain fields, conditional formatting, uh, have sort of enum fields, uh, so it's just a drop down instead of completed, done, sent, all of those things meaning maybe the same thing, maybe different things, just have one. Um, let's talk a little bit about data integrity. It's gonna show up again later in this talk. That incorrect or misleading data causes the operational chaos that we were just talking about. It also gives you a really poor foundation for future tools because you can't trust what your tools are reading from and, and writing to. And it also causes friction. Spoiler alert, we eventually moved to Postgres, and when we did, we had to spend three weeks cleaning data from this part of the process. So investing in data quality always has guaranteed returns in our experience, and we wish we had done more of that earlier. So enable volunteer tasks is the next piece of this phase. Our inboxes were a train wreck, as, as we discussed. So let's build an email tool to take some of those emails out of Gmail, open up those emails for actual communication with uh, individuals instead of the initial matching emails. So we built a Flask app hosted on Heroku, very simple, sent emails via Mailgun. There's a basic UI that the volunteers could do to kind of customize that, that email, um, but it took a lot of the legwork out of our volunteer time and, and kept it uh, very simple for folks. Um, it was integrated with Google Sheets, so as they were working on a donation, there would be a link pre-populated they could click on, and it would just open up this Flask app uh, with everything pre-populated and no more copy-pasting for our volunteers. Uh, and we also realized, okay, how can we take things out of Google Sheets? Well, verifying is a healthcare worker, actually a healthcare worker, was kind of a self-contained task. So let's try and make something, make a tool for that, but we didn't want to build and maintain a web app just for that. We didn't want to have to figure out how to deploy it, have a version controls, all that kind of stuff. And luckily, a, one of our tech volunteers knew about something called Retool. There's a lot of solutions like this. It's a, a low code solution um, that allows you to build workflows and you kind of drag and drop UI elements to create a basically a mini web app for our users. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it in the future, but this was a lifesaver, and they were super generous, both with free retool and their time, so big shout out to these guys. Lastly, measure impact. Uh, you need to know, are you actually shipping? Are you actually doing something useful? Um, luckily, since we're in Google Sheets, you just open up another tab, point to the other tabs, and make pretty graphs. So here's where the system looks like after phase two, and things are going well. We have shipped 1,600 masks after four days. So now that things are a little more acceptably working, um, it's time to scale your impact. Uh, so this is when you hit phase three, um, after you've kind of found that product market fit and after you have a solution that actually you can do repeatedly. Uh, out there in the world, uh, COVID and the PPE shortage hadn't changed that much. Again, it had actually only been four days, even though it felt like weeks. Um, so these very acute PPE shortages are still getting much worse. Um, 
for us, uh, the four days had been truly insane for us on the tech side, but also on the more operational side. Um, Liz, one of our co-founders, had gone out and started getting press um, from NPR, ABC News, Fox News, some local San Francisco news, and we were getting way more donations and volunteers, which enabled us to scale. So the question here becomes, how can you increase your impact as much as possible? And this has become sort of like a classic software engineering scaling thing. So your planning horizon is now a luxurious approximately three days. Uh, you can take exactly one very deep breath and then get back to work. And your technical priorities are one, to increase your volunteer efficiency, which probably means it's time for better internal tools. And you probably at this point should make a real database. So uh, volunteer tooling breakdowns. Let us say once again that Google Sheets and our shared inboxes were not working that well right now. Uh, the rate limiting for email sends is killing us. And at this point, there were so many people trying to use our sheet that most of the time the page literally did not load. Um, so we were like, let's just pay Google for stuff. Um, we can probably pay for more email sends. We can probably pay to get better access to Google Sheets. And we tried, we really tried. We tried to pay Google, and we could not figure out how to pay Google for these things. Um, and so instead, we decided to build it ourselves. <laughs> um, so to start with, we were like, we have got to fix the email thing. Um, we realized that what we were asking our volunteers to do was basically a support flow, right? So it's like support tickets, you're getting emails from people, you need to respond to them with information. Um, we asked a volunteer to go out and find us something, like could we use Zendesk, help us figure it out, um, and they found FreeScout, um, which is an open source self-hosted Zendesk alternative. It's really similar to Zendesk, really similar to Help Scout, and it was very, very easy to set up and get working. It had a lot of functionality we needed, people could assign cases to themselves, there were like email templates and all that good stuff, um, and it was a real lifesaver. We used it for the rest of the project. We also realized, using the shiny Google Sheets analytics we'd implemented in the previous phase, that volunteers were spending a lot of time making matches, but then some of those matches were never getting completed. We had a status where we'd like say, like, okay, this donation is matched, and then it would just sit there. Um, and we figured that this was probably happening because people were just never opening the emails from us. Um, so we added a Twilio integration to that original little Heroku email app so that a volunteer could, with one click, also send a text message. Um, the text message, I think, originally just said, please check your email <laughs> mask match. Um, and it really helped. It worked. Um, yeah, it worked. <laughs> um, it helped us move a lot of those, like, you know, sitting around donations into a completed phase. All right, next, data integrity again. Um, so we had locked down the Google Sheet a lot, um, but again, now the page wasn't loading, um, it was awful. Uh, so we were like, we have to just move everyone out of Google Sheets. Uh, so we built a lot more retool tools. Uh, we went from one retool tool for just that validation process to retool tools for pretty much everything. Uh, this was amazing because we could back it by Google Sheets, and then when we were ready to switch to Postgres, which we will see in one moment, uh, we could just switch over the backends. Um, made it super easy to go through that transition for our volunteers. And finally, it's time for a real database. Um, we did pick Postgres. Um, it was easy. We ran it on AWS. It was great. It solved a lot of problems for us. Um, first of all, um, Postgres has way better I.O. scalability characteristics than Google Sheets. Um, so that was a big upgrade for us. A big thing was security. This meant um, fewer volunteers, only our tech team, had direct access to our data. Um, again, at this point, we've got like 200-something volunteers. Um, and so that was becoming a big concern. Uh, data hygiene, um, Postgres has some nice normal stuff like foreign keys and constraints. Um, <laughs> it was like a dream. <laughs> uh, and finally, stability. Uh, this was actually the most important thing. Uh, moving over to Postgres unlocked for us a whole world of potential automations, um, which we'll get into in the next phase. So uh, by the end of phase three, um, we basically moved to some actual software. Um, it was really exciting. Uh, and by the end of the phase, uh, the scaling was starting to take off. So like we sent 1,600 masks in the first four days. About two weeks later, we'd sent 93,000 masks. Um, so the scaling was like having the intended effect. Cool. So we were scaling. Uh, Phase four is called Stabilize. I, I think you'll see why in a minute. Um, at this point, it's April 10th. We're a, we're a month in, um, and this phase took us about a month. So in the world, the COVID curve has started to flatten, but there's still a huge need for PP at this point. Um, however, our team is burning out. Our tech team is burning out. Some of our volunteers are burning out. Uh, so we realized well, actually, let's focus a little bit on how do we maintain our impact, 
but still ensure a stable organization. This, you have a planning horizon here of maybe two to three weeks, and your technical priorities are to harden your tooling, try and introduce automation, and then better metrics. So hardening the tools. Constant tooling changes, as Emma was just describing, we changed basically everything that our volunteers were doing in a very short span. And a lot of volunteers burned out from that. It, nobody likes coming in, thinking that they're going to be able to help out, and having to relearn everything every single time. Um, and there were also a lot of bugs introduced from all of our code that we had just written. Um, so that was also very demoralizing for our volunteers. Let's improve the UX and improve the documentation for those users. Um, let's start working inside of Retool. There, you can put JavaScript in there um, and, and really uh, take that to the next level. Um, and also try and fix some of the bugs. We love Retool, but it doesn't use database transactions really well. We had to sort of hack it to make that happen. And that was super important to actually leverage this amazing database that we had now instead of Google Sheets. We also then were able to do automation. So some folks on our team made it a, an auto matcher that automatically handled that initial find somebody who has masks, find somebody who needs masks, make sure they're close together, um, and say this is a good match. It was a bin packing algorithm. It worked on AWS. It was a worker running on AWS, um, made possible by that Postgres database. And in Retool, there was an interface for a volunteer to just go, yep, that looks good. Uh, let's, let's send the emails. Finally, better metrics. Uh, I don't know if you noticed in the tech stack from last time, but our tech stack actually took a step back in terms of analytics. We, never, we didn't have those nice graphs anymore. Instead, it was Emma and myself writing, running SQL queries against the database, and that got old really fast. So we decided, OK, let's try and do a business intelligence tool. Maybe that's Tableau or Domo or whatever. We ended up going with Metabase. It's open source. Uh, it could be really easily deployed on AWS via Docker. It, we just spun it up, pointed it, it at the database, and it was perfect. So highly recommend that. Here's where we are at the end of our stabilization uh, period. So a few more retool tools, the auto matcher, and then Metabase. And at this point, all that scaling work that we had done in uh, phase three had really started to continue to, to, to work. And so we were up over half a million masks at this point. OK. So uh, we were in a pretty steady state at this point uh, within mask match. But around us, the world was changing. So the crisis really like, took a turn here. Um, the requests that we were getting from healthcare workers started to really taper off, um, which was awesome, because that meant that healthcare workers were able to get masks and PPE from their employers now instead of needing to get it donated. Um, in the US at that time also, we were starting to face another COVID wave, um, and we were concerned that we were going to get into this place where if the PPE shortage recurred, we weren't going to have the same number of donations. Um, again, we were just asking people to like, go into their closets and get whatever spare masks they had, and at some point it's like, that supply is over, right? <laughs> like, it's not like an endless number of N95s sitting in people's tool sheds. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we didn't get into a place where we were promising help where we couldn't deliver. So, in phase five, um, your problems are no longer technical, they are purely existential. Um, should you chase a new crisis with what you've built, or should you shut down? Um, the planning horizon is like one month-ish, but really it's like however long it takes you to figure this out. Uh, and you do have technical priorities here. Number one is to keep delivering impact, um, because you can keep helping out even while you're making these heady decisions. Uh, and also evaluate your systems to try to figure out what your options are as an organization. Uh, in terms of continuing to deliver impact, one thing that we definitely encountered in this phase is as the crisis kind of, the PPE crisis specifically, came out of the news, um, we weren't getting as many new volunteers in to replace volunteers who might have been burning out. And so we didn't make many tech changes, um, but we did make tweaks to increase volunteer efficiency. Um, the auto matcher that we had deployed in the last phase like really saved our bacon here. Um, and we delivered almost half of our mask volume in this phase, um, even with a much reduced volunteer force. Next, adapt to the world around you. Um, we don't have, we can't tell you exactly what your crisis is gonna be like, um, but here are some of the framing questions that we use to determine like what our next steps should be. 
First, does your crisis still exist? Um, for us, the answer was not really. Uh, the PPE supply chains around the world had normalized so much um, that we weren't providing that much value to healthcare workers anymore. Next, is your solution still the most effective? Um, so despite the fact that we were not getting that many donations anymore, the donations we were getting were suddenly much larger. So people are writing in saying like, I have 100,000 masks and I want you to distribute them. Um, we did handle some of those donations, but our system was really set up for those much smaller donations that you could just send to someone's house. Um, it's really hard to send 100,000 masks to like some doctor's house and ask them to bring them into the hospital for you. Um, there was another organization called Get Us PPE that had been trying to coordinate much larger donations from much earlier. Um, and so for us, there was an easy option to redirect those large donors to someone else whose solutions was better built for that situation. Next, can your technical system solve a different problem? Is there something else we could be donating from people's workbenches and their closets um, to healthcare workers or to someone else? Our system was so purpose-built for masks, it just did not make sense for us to try to do that. Um, but maybe you'll be in a different situation. Maybe your tech will be way cleaner than ours. Um, and finally, how burnt out are you? How burnt out is your team? Um, we were extremely <laughs> burnt out. We had basically been running Mask Match as a second full-time job at this point for almost three months. Um, again, we really thought this was going to be like a fun single weekend project, uh, and we did not have the bandwidth to try to pivot this to address a different crisis. So that left us with the option to gracefully shut down. Um, we don't have anything groundbreaking to say about this. The only thing we want to emphasize here is um, it's important to communicate clearly with your volunteers if you have volunteers. Um, they've been kind of keeping you running for months, and you don't want to hear about this, them to hear about this from like your tweet or your blog post. Um, send nice emails, text your favorite volunteers. Um, it's just polite. Uh, and then go through normal tech shutdown stuff. So restrict access to your tools and your data as early as possible. Um, export your database. Um, don't leave your database like hanging out there on AWS for hackers to find, and shut your tools down. And then finally, uh, write a tech conference talk to share what you learned with the world. Check. <laughs> uh, so here's our final project status. Um, we sent uh, not quite a million masks. Uh, we sent them to about 6,000 healthcare workers all around the United States. Uh, we built an entire startup's worth of tools in about four weeks. Uh, this is our final tech stack. Um, it is total skunk works. Um, it was a Frankenstein tech stack, but it did the job. Um, it got us to where we needed to go, um, and at every stage it enabled us to like move forward and keep making progress and keep having impact. Great. So we want to look back and recap some of the lessons that we hope you can take away from this. In this framework, when you are yourself trying to respond to a crisis with technology, try and think about which one of these phases are you in and what, what problem are you trying to solve? So are you trying to validate your idea? Are you trying to make it repeatable? Are you trying to vertically scale it? Are you trying to stabilize it? Or are you in the process of needing to figure out should you adapt or should you shut down? Our real hope for this is that, um, not that you're going to go through these exact stages as we did, um, but we hope that by having some context about what this could be like for you, um, you feel a little more confident about like saying yes. Um, if someone comes to you with an idea and you don't know if it's a good idea, but there's a crisis out there and maybe your tech skills could help, um, remember, there is, there is a plan. You can follow our plan. Uh, it's worth saying yes and, and trying. And of course, we need to thank Everyone on this slide, um, but especially Liz Klinger, our CEO and fearless leader. Uh, you can't build tools for nobody, so obviously our volunteers who actually did all the work of mass match. And then, of course, our volunteers can't send mass if there aren't mass to send. So the 7,000 mass donors who uh, reached into their uh, closets to, to help out. With that, thank you. Okay, so the question was, uh, what, did we have this framework at the time, or did we come up with it retrospectively, and what were the, re what were the resources at the time? Uh, we did not have this at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is all retrospective. Um, I don't think, I mean, we, we don't have like an appendix slide with great resources. A book that I desperately, that I read since that I desperately wish I had read before is a book called uh, Mutual Aid by Dean Spade. Um, if you are interested in crisis response, cannot recommend it enough. Um, it touches on a lot of the operational and equity pieces that we did not have time to get into in this talk. Um, but. We would love to talk about it at any point yeah. as well. Um, we could write an entire talk just on that. We also were 
the sort of COO role for this organization as well, managing all the volunteers. Yeah, the question is like, how do you practice for a situation like this? Um, we, had, <laughs> we, we had done a hackathon together previously. It was not good practice for this. Um, I think um, part of the difficulty of this and the reason that our framework is a little vague is that it's gonna be very purpose-built around the problem we're trying to solve. I don't know that... I, I, I mean, I think that maybe doing th something like setting up a conference would help out with that. Um, so, or I don't know, also if you can work on internal tools within your organization. I came from a background of doing internal tools, so I was familiar with BI tools and you know, Retool had come across at some point as well. That's a way of doing it. It might be a, a too big of a change, but maybe doing something like a conference or, or trying to set up those, um, clicking those systems together could do that. But also, you'll figure it out. Uh, you know, as long as you have, <laughs> as long as you have a, a good tech team, like it's a bunch of people, smart people in a room together, like really motivated, you will, you'll be fine. So the question is, were there any security concerns, and how do we handle those, especially around emails? Certainly. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, there were so many security concerns. Um, we we tried to mitigate it as best we did, as best we could. Um, a lot of our mitigations were very operational. So um, it was like we locked down, like no one could export the whole Google Sheet, for example. Um, we did a lot of like permissioning stuff. Um, we also had like a volunteer code of conduct that spelled out really specifically, um, you will never export any data outside of our systems. Um, and which you is will not, not a... contact people yeah, except yeah. like, you know, oh, well, I just want to talk to this person, no. Yeah, yeah. So there was um, the policy. And then there was pulling it out of Google Sheets as soon as we could as yeah, well I think into Retool. The, and yeah, moving to Retool, but also the move to Postgres was definitely like something like that was part of our concern was like, okay, we have so many volunteers now. We are not personally, we have volunteer captains who are onboarding people, but we're no longer personally vetting volunteers. Um, yeah, I wish I had like a great answer about like we did these smart things for security. Um, but I think at the time we were like, we just want to trust that our volunteers are here to help, um, and we're going to make a code of conduct that allows us to eject people who abuse anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the question is, did we have to deal with abusers and trolls? There were a couple people who said, ooh, I'm a healthcare worker, I need 10,000 masks. And they were usually pretty easy to spot. It's possible that some people got through, um, but that's why we started uh, really verifying people pretty closely. And we, we've, we've revamped that and made it a little harder um, to prove that you were a uh, healthcare worker um, a couple of days into it. Yeah. Also, most people who wrote in were saying, like, I need 50 masks. Um, I think just the scale of donations we were providing was not enough for us to be a target. And anyone who said, like, I need 10,000 masks, we were automatically like, whoa. <laughs> um, I think on the flip side, in our volunteer community, um, we did not have a problem with like within the community, people being horrible to each other, which is really lucky. We also said like no volunteers who are like, like we got a bunch of emails from people who were like high schoolers who were doing like, you know, school from home and were like, I wanna help out. And we said no one under 18. Um, we also said like no volunteers who don't already know how to use Google Sheets and Slack. Slack yeah. And so that mostly meant we were getting people who were like professional age um, and who were used to like working together with other people in a virtual space. Um, and so that I think just like made it a little easier for us. Yeah. Cool. Okay, maybe one more question and then we'll let y'all go to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the question is like, some of our stuff is not free, how did we pay for it? Uh, which is a great question. Um, we did get donations. Um, we asked for, we like set up a GoFundMe to get like $3,000 to pay for, we're like that'll basically fund us forever. And then we got way more money. Um, a great thing, I mean, this is a horrible thing to say. In a crisis situation, people want to help, and giving you money is a really easy way for people to help. And so um, some of the things, like, you know, we implemented Free Scout, which was free, and it was great. If we had just paid for Zendesk, would that have saved us any time? Um, you're going to get money from people, like, yeah. most likely. And again, like, you're not trying to run this forever. So even if you are, like, if, if we had paid all our Twilio costs out of pocket, I think we would have spent, like, $345. <laughs> um, so yeah. it, it's just not, an, it's, it's not, 
largely enough money that you couldn't just pay for stuff to make your life easier. And in fact, I think we wish we had just paid for more stuff to yeah. make our lives easier. Or just ask for more free stuff. So oh, yeah. Retool gave us free stuff. Um, y Combinator, the accelerator in San Francisco, they just said, here's $10,000, go spend it on AWS, whatever you want. So Postgres like, was running on a server that was paid by them. Um, I think Squarespace gave us Squarespace that for free. Squarespace gave us our website for free. So every, awesome. everyone was super generous at the time, um, and, and we appreciate that. Yeah. Cool. Well, well thank right. you for coming to our talk, and yeah, uh, let's get live. <laughs>